the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Thank you very much. I uh, have said it before, and I'll, I'm sure I'll say it again. I'm not sure that I uh, have the capacity to contribute uh, how much I've received. I've been so greatly blessed. Thank you, choir, what's still left up there, and orchestra. Uh, the music was fabulous. Um, I love Ernie Haas and Signature Sounds, and Ernie and I have been friends a long time. We've had a, a lot of great meetings together, and God has used him so many times at Woodstock over the years, and I think we're getting ready to do some jubilees together with my family, so we'll look forward to that. And then um, I want to say a special word to Miss Jenny that sang uh, she took me right uh, to the gates of heaven and let me uh, check on my mom. <laughs> that was, I mean, it's amazing how music can transport you, and, um, and it, it really did. So it deeply ministered in my life. So I've just been greatly blessed. And we're not trying to see who can outdo who, but even at dinner tonight on a personal level, I was talking about how long Mike and I have been uh, friends, and I love him and Kathy. Uh, Jerry Falwell used to say, I served with him 12 years before he died as one of his board members, and he would um, always say, remember, if when you die, you have five forever friends, you die wealthy. And so there's nothing like uh, friends, and especially those that you'll know forever. So I'm so grateful for that. And I feel like when I come here, it's sort of a family reunion. I'm uh, preaching here in North Carolina tonight, then back in Georgia tomorrow, and then where am I going? South Carolina, Arkansas, and then back on Sunday, morning and night in um, North Carolina. I'm starting a, um, a three-year tour this coming Sunday night all across the United States uh, on a Who's Your One tour. And I'm starting in Fayetteville, and I didn't choose Fayetteville, North Carolina, but it's right next to where I was born in Lumberton, North Carolina. So I've really been rallying the Lumbee Indians, just in case there's an uprising over there. <laughs> and so, um, and they're coming. They've contacted me. They're coming in large numbers. And so I'll start there and literally just uh, crisscross America uh, for at least the next three years and and even in those three years, I still miss 22 states. So anyway, we're trying to get there. But I'm leading a campaign, and just say it to you briefly, uh, called Who's Your One? Um, the evangelical church is as at lowest time that it's been in over 70 years in winning people to faith in Christ and baptizing them. You'd have to go back 70 years to find the baptismal numbers that Southern Baptists reported last year. So I've committed uh, the last quarter of my life in two areas, evangelism, and I've been training pastors for 25 years. So I've continued to train bivocational pastors, church planners, and just pastors in general. Did you know that if just one in every 10 people that attend our churches, and you may not know this, but on any given Sunday morning, the average attendance in Southern Baptist churches is 5 million 222,000 and some change. So, so to give you uh, my, my passion, uh, if 10% of the Sunday morning attendance in Southern Baptist life led one person to Christ, only 10%, over the next 12 months, we would not only double baptisms from last year, we'd have the single greatest year in the history of our denomination. And I want to say something to you, just say it candidly. You will do a lot of great things. I love to preach. I love great music. But there's nothing, and I'm going to show you in the message, nothing trumps leading another person to Jesus. Not, nothing's more important. The greatest miracle God ever performed is the salvation of a soul. He died to save us. He was buried to save us. 
He rose from the dead to save us. And so even in this room tonight, as I travel and I do a lot of different events, if I could just challenge you. And, and what we're asking in uh, the numbers, I was showing uh, Josh and Christy, and I love them to death. And Jean, I love you. And Gina, honest, I feel like Gina and Josh and Christy are my oldest children. I just I love them to death. And um, I, I think about... Um, if you just said, God, over the next 12 months, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me, and then really intentionally went after him. If you'd have been at church Sunday before last, because I was preaching in Kansas uh, yesterday, but if you'd have been at church uh, Sunday a week ago, you would have seen on the front row Grace. Grace is Janet's one. She's 45 years old. She's Chinese. She's Buddhist. But we've been sharing the gospel with her taking her out to meal, sharing the gospel with her American husband. And he, he's just kind of pushed back. And when I gave the invitation, I watched Janet put her arm around her and plead with her to come to Jesus. And by the way, there ain't nothing wrong with that. And just said, I'll go with you. And then my one is Percy. And I've already presented the gospel to Percy. And I shared the gospel Sunday afternoon with Robert from Las Vegas that came to our church and then I took him to lunch. But I, I want to be faithful. And I'll be honest, I've had the privilege of pastoring a really large church. And we've seen a lot, thousands, and, and no exaggeration, thousands of people baptized into our fellowship. But that's not really how I measure the ministry God's given me. I want to personally, individually, introduce people to faith in Jesus Christ. So anyway, thanks for letting me say that. Mark chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, and uh, I, I want to encourage you to do something. Let's take a moment to introduce this message, <clears throat> but I want to speak on this subject. What happens when Jesus is in the house? And if you've got a pencil, pen, lipstick, or mascara, I want to encourage you <laughs> to make a few notes, and I'm, I'm going to show you, and honestly, I, I'm a Bible expositor. And I'm going to walk you through, not what I think happens, what the Bible says happens when Jesus is in the house. You know, I was thinking the other day, we, uh, one, one of the great periods of ministry in our fellowship is one Sunday we had 1,300, and the next Sunday we had 2,700. <laughs> we grew, we doubled in one, one week at our, our fellowship, and then just the steady growth over all of the years, and then last year was the highest attendance, average attendance, in the history of the church, 32 years in. I'm in my 33rd year now. But, but I really want to win people to Christ. So what happens when Jesus is in the house? Let's, do, let's stand in honor of the reading of the word. Mark chapter 1, you'll know the story. I was in this city 12 weeks ago. It's one of my favorite places to visit in Israel. Verse 1, the Bible says, And again, Jesus entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. And the King James says it was noised abroad that Jesus was in the house. And the Bible says immediately many gathered so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And Jesus, listen to what Jesus did at church. <laughs> he preached the word to them. Jesus preachers preach the word. Amen. Somebody says, I'm just trying to connect with the people. No, they don't need to connect with you. They need to connect with him. It's about like the carnal people that say, I'd never go to a large church because the preacher can't know us. Just for the record's sake, God didn't call me to preach that you could know me. I'm to preach so you can know him. And if I introduce you to him, you'll think more of me. <laughs> then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And by the way, everybody brings their friends when Jesus is in the house. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, he let down the 
bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now look at verse number 6. Some of the scribes were sitting there reasoning their heart. Now I want you to get this in your mind. History teaches that when a scribe or a Pharisee or a Sadducee would attend a public worship, they were always given the front row, the seat of honor. So, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> He's, um, but no, really, the, the, the Pharisees were sitting on the front. So they were right up front center, and Jesus is the speaker for today. And so they lowered this man through the roof, and the first word spoken from Jesus is, Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sin but God only? I was with Robbie Zacharias the other day, so I'm not trying to blow smoke. We're just really close personal friends. And we were talking about conversion. And he said, You know where people get confused? They believe that getting saved is an intellectual decision. And it's not. It's moral. And I'm going to show you that in the text. Somebody called me the other day and said, did you ever see the, the documentary on the ark? They really believe from out of space, factual, that they've seen something in Mount Ararat that would resemble the size of the ark under the ice. I said, yeah, I've seen that documentary. And they said, think of how many people would believe if we could find the ark. No, you don't get saved because you find the ark. For by grace are you saved through faith. But immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit, they reasoned thus within themselves. By the way, that's a gift I'm glad I don't have. I'm glad I don't know what you're thinking while I'm preaching. But Jesus knew. And so what do you do? He would address and by the way, while I'm preaching, he knows what you're thinking. And that's why somebody says, you've read my mail. And I didn't read your mail. God knows your name. And he speaks. And the Bible says, why do you so reason these things in your hearts? And listen to this question. Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven you. Or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, here's my favorite part. We never saw anything like this. Again, the King James says it this way. We never saw it on this fashion. When Jesus is in the house, people will leave saying, never did we see it like this. Father, speak into our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. According to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1, Capernaum was referred to as Jesus' own city. You know the story. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, and when he started his ministry after being baptized at the Jordan, he set up his headquarters in the city of Capernaum. Capernaum is located on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, happens to also be the hometown of Peter and Andrew. It was a city that was known much of the activity of the Lord Jesus from firsthand experience. If you want to talk about a town of opportunity, Capernaum was it. However, according to the Bible, this city for the most part remained very unresponsive to the message of Jesus Christ. We live in the Bible Belt. Believe it or not, we're becoming more and more unresponsive. Last year, the leading state in winning people to Jesus and baptizing them was Florida. That is not the Bible Belt. We're unresponsive. We've heard it so many times. There was such rejection that Matthew records Jesus' words 
of personal rebuke to Capernaum in the neighboring towns. Let me just give you the gist of it. Matthew 11, verse 20 through 24. Jesus said, if what I've done here had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. Here's what he said. Listen to this language. I've exalted you to heaven, but I'm going to cast you down to hell. I've walked through every one of those villages that Jesus referred to. They're all together there around Capernaum. So the text causes me to beg the question. When Jesus works in our midst, do we still question his power and authority to do mighty things? So the question, what happens when Jesus is in the house? Number one, the word is preached. The Bible teaches that Jesus opened the Bible and preached to them. When Jesus is in the house, there's a drawing power. The Bible says it was noise that he was in the house. Jesus was back. He had been there in the past, and his return drew a crowd. The greatest thing that can happen in any church is for word to get out. Jesus... Christ is in the house. We hear all the things about what makes church great today. Hardly ever do you say, you ought to come. Jesus is there. There's a drawing power about Jesus. He said it himself in John 12, 32. He said, if, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This small Palestinian town, this small Palestinian home, usually a one-room structure with a flat roof. Many scholars believe it could have been Jesus' home. More believe that it was the home of Simon Peter. When Jesus is in the house, the word is preached and there's drawing power. But there's also dynamic preaching. He preached the word to them. The word preached That's used here as a little word, laleo. It means in a conversation tone. Simple, down-to-earth, easy-to-understand language. He was feeding them the Word of God. I I did an interview today, and uh, I said my favorite verse in the Bible is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. The righteous man walks in his integrity, and his children are blessed after him. Nothing blesses me more than to see all of my children and my grandchildren serving the Lord. All of us are serving the Lord. We all have served the Lord by the grace of God the whole time. I was out with a family the other day, and I said, let's go to dinner. And they said, we can't. And I'm not being ugly. I just thought I would say this. We got to go home because we have to put our baby according to what we're reading to bed at 730. How did you and Miss Janet do it? I said, oh, we'd go out after church with the people and just to fellowship and share Jesus and my kids would fall asleep and we'd push them up under the table and they didn't turn out weird. (laughs) Maybe instead of reading Dr. Spock, you might ought to read the Bible and you might even check with some people that have raised a godly generation and find out what you did. It's like the family that won't bring their child to church for six months because they're afraid they'll get sick in the nursery and they go to the doctor's office. Go figure. (laughs) Where all the sick children are. So my favorite New Testament verse, listen to this, is Mark 12, 37. And the common man heard him gladly. You know what's wrong in America? We got some people that think They're not common. Every person I've ever met, it it helps me to be a vibrant witness because I don't care what they have, where they work, what they know, they're common. They may have done better in some areas, but they're just common people. And the common man heard Jesus gladly. When Jesus preached, four things happened. Number one, he drew a crowd. And by the way, you don't have to embellish Jesus. He's already altogether lovely. Just present him for who he is. Allow him to be himself. 
Number two, when Jesus preached, he didn't just draw a crowd. He drew people of confidence. People came, listen to me, they came to church with a spirit of expectancy. You know what's happened in the American church? Our expectors have expired. And the average person doesn't get on their knees before they come to church to pray for the minister to say, God, use him. Anoint him with the Holy Spirit. Save people. Change lives. Set people free. When Jesus is there, people of confidence. It drew a cripple. People with needs will come to a church if word gets out that Jesus is there. But it also drew criticism. Anytime Jesus is doing something, it will be criticized. The Bible says he preached. That's the Laleo. Speaks of how he presented, but it says he preached the word. Most of you know it's just one of those words like agape for love. We know the word for word, and it's the word logos. You can even get a, a something for your computer. Logos. But the word he uses here is logon. It was used of the message of salvation. So listen to this. When Jesus preached that day in Capernaum, he preached the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel. He preached the good news. In my early days in particular, people used to say, Woodstock's a good place to go get saved. But after there, you need to go somewhere else. Because all he does is preaches the gospel. Probably the greatest passage in your Bible on the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So when Jesus was in the house, the Bible teaches that the word is preached. Number two, faith was persistent. What a passage of determination. It's so great in showing their love for the sick man and their faith in the power of Jesus to heal, that they would not take no for an answer. How, how did you get grace to church the other day? Because Southern Baptists no longer bring people to church. And just for the record's sake, 85% of the people that will ever get saved will come to church on the arm of a friend. 85. I'm a Christian today because N.W. Pridgen, a Lumbee Indian, would not give up on inviting Janet and I to church. This is good, just to remind you. The night I got saved at Longleaf, God saved the church's next pastor. Now let that settle in. I got saved. Three years, God called me to preach. I went to Gardner Webb College, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, straight back to Longleaf. The night he saved me, he was saving the church's next pastor. Um, I, uh, in teaching evangelism, I teach that you need to know the truth about actual, actualities and possibilities. See, actually, this is who a person is. I've got a little granddaughter, and she'll always say she's special needs. She'll say, actually, Papa. And I think that's such a big word for a, a, a cerebral palsy granddaughter. Um, can you imagine, let, let's just go back for a minute. I'm 20 years old. I'm managing J.C. Bullard Pool Hall on Carolina Beach Road in Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm a high school dropout. I'll fight at the drop of a hat. Somebody says, well, you're not very big. No, but I'm wound tight. And the bottom line is uh, I was a scrapper, and I didn't have to win, but, but I, I didn't mind fighting. And, and I, I'm ashamed of this. I, I was a thief. I've been arrested for fighting. I've been arrested for drunk driving. I don't know what it's like to go without driver's license. If you'd have gone to the pool room, you'd have found me with a bottle of beer in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and taking God's name in vain on my lips and trying to hustle someone out of their money. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said when he got converted, he lost 80% of his vocabulary. And I understand that. Now, in actuality, I wonder how many people didn't witness to me because they probably thought, 
he is not interested. I doubt anybody ever walked by and saw me and said, that boy would make a fine preacher. <laughs> see, see, actualities keep you from possibilities. What Jesus, when he saw Simon, he said, he didn't need to say this, he said, you are Simon, but you shall be called Cephas. Simon is wavering one. Cephas is a massive rock. Uh, Jesus sees us not in actuality for who we are. Jesus sees us who we can become. C could you imagine? I mean, I think this is humorous. Could you imagine me there cussing and swearing and, and somebody saying, you know what? One day, that boy will be the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> You will never go to your neighbor's house as long as you only see him in actuality. But they were persistent. They were, they were committed to going to any length to bring their friend with his problems to Jesus and ask Jesus to deal with them. I wrote down six things. I'm just going to read them. Listen to this. I wrote this. What faith says, this was determination. Number one, faith says there are always many who will never reach Jesus unless someone takes them. I text Grace the other night and I said, hey, Grace, um, I'm preaching tomorrow morning at Woodstock. Uh, I sure would love for you to come and join Janet and I. If you will come, Grace, Janet and I will save you a seat on the front row. We want you to sit with us, and then after the service, we'd like to take you to Tuscany's for lunch. I mean, we didn't beat around the bush. Hey, we'd like for you to come sometime. No, no, we want you to come. We want you to sit with us. And we want you to go to lunch with us and we'll treat you to lunch. A friend called me and said, she, I believe she's as close as we've ever seen her in coming to Christ. Number two, listen to this statement. If there were more bringing believers, there would be more saved sinners. And, and by the way, it would add a different dynamic to a worship service if you were sitting beside somebody on their way to hell. You would be broken and pleading, oh God, use Brother Mike. Oh God, save this person this morning. Nobody would be leaving during the invitation. But why stay for the invitation when you don't give a royal flip of whether somebody's changed forever? I like to do that at Woodstock because nobody will leave that Sunday. It's the next week. You know what I did at Woodstock? I apologized to him recently. I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I've, I've been here all these years and I've confused y'all. When I give the invitation, it's to come down here. So this morning, forgive me, but I've accommodated you. I put my counselors out in the foyer. Nobody left that Sunday. I want you to think with me for a moment. Well, I'll tell you what, Brother Mike really preached a sermon Sunday. I'll tell you this, it would, have been a, it would have been hard, stay with me, it would have been hard for a lost person to stay in their seat. No, it wouldn't. Why would you say that, Pastor Johnny? You didn't move. You know him. He lives in your heart and you don't obey him. What right do we have to criticize a pagan who doesn't know God for not responding when those of us do, who do know him don't respond? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. It's just a question. It's just a question. Because things have changed in the culture of the church. So a question. When's the last time the Holy Spirit spoke to you through the music or the message and you publicly responded? Can I, can I give a testimony? A few weeks ago, I was preaching, but I'd made my mind up before I got there. I got me a card, and I filled it out and rededicated my life and asked them to read the card at the end of the service. Number three, they had faith to believe Jesus would meet his need. You do anything to get them there. If you just believe he beat the meat. And, and I know you can go and share with them. 
But I'm just telling you, there's something. I can't explain it. I, I surveyed our church recently. And I asked them some good questions. Like I asked them with thousands on a Sunday morning. If you came to Jesus Christ in a Billy Graham crusade or watching Dr. Graham on television, stand to your feet. And the, and, and black, the first two to stand came to Jesus in Rhodesia. Lance and Penny Davis, and then served in South Africa for missionaries as the next 30 years. They're my prayer partners. They prayed me over here. They're praying for me now. They pray for me every day. Then I said, if, if somebody came by your house with faith or evangelism explosion, and I do all those. I'm a personal witness. I know what the Bible says, do the work of an evangelist. But I said, if that's how you came to Christ, and maybe 30 stood, and then I said, if you got saved because somebody encouraged you to go to church and you heard the gospel stand, and 90% of the 6,000 people stood to their feet. Number four, they put feet to their prayers. Number five, they did not permit the difficult circumstances to discourage them. Number six, they worked together and dared to do something different. So they dug up the compacted thatch roof and lowered the man through the exposed beams to the floor below. It may be the greatest Bible story that inspired three words that I put on the marquee the first month I was pastor at Woodstock. These words, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes is build a hundred million dollar campus. Whatever it takes caused us to go to four services with the windows raised at night and people in the vestibule to be able to hear. We rented 19 off-campus sites for Bible study that cost us thousands of dollars to use one hour a week, whatever it takes. I, I would have loved to have been there. Could, could you imagine being in church and when you're preaching, uh, something falls on your face and you knock it off and then it begins to fall in a greater capacity and, and then you look up and somebody's lowering somebody through the ceiling I bet those Pharisees really had a time number three quickly when Jesus is in the house forgiveness is present hey, hey let me do something I know you already know this but let me just say see if I can say it a little different to draw us in forgiveness is the greatest miracle Jesus ever performed why would you say that Pastor Johnny to follow me number one it meets the greatest need number two it costs the greatest price number three it brings the greatest blessing and number four it has the most lasting results now the Pharisees are sitting on the front row they lower the person into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and says this. Now listen carefully to this. This is where it is more moral than intellectual. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now I could say that. I could walk out there and look at one of you right now and say, your sins are forgiven you. You know what somebody say? Well, he can say that, but you can't prove that. You can't see that. And by the way, when a pagan gets saved, when a, when a hellion, a hellion gets saved, and they go to their workplace and they tell the people they work with, I got saved. They don't respond. Why? They don't have to. In the back of their mind, they do have this thought. We'll see. Because if you got saved, you're going to be different. So here's the best way I know to say it. No change, no Christ. So when somebody says, yeah, I got saved, I just never really changed. I'm sorry. You may have got wet, you may have walked an aisle, you may have said something. You did not get saved. Any man in Christ is a new creation. All things are passed away. All things. Jesus changes your want-tos. I, I, I love to just write a little stuff, and I wrote this statement. Son, your sins are forgiven you. The first word, put this man in the family of God. The second word, put him in the fellowship of God. Forgiveness, what a blessed word for a sinned, hardened soul. The debt discharged, guilt gone, conscience cleansed, 
past pardon, record removed. I, I, I just thought if it's in my mind, it's not in my notes, if I can't get it out of my mind, I'm going to say a word about it. Um, it's sort of like uh, a reunion every year. You know, Gina, I come, got to get my picture made with you tonight. Gina, I think you were 15 when I met you. And I was pastor at Longleaf. You'll love this story, Ernie. And uh, her mother started attending Longleaf. And um, I've, I've always been one to go to homes or go knock on doors and share the gospel. And so she was dating uh, a pool room, former pool room buddy of mine that started coming to our church. So they asked me if I would marry him. And so I was in the process of going to marry them. So I wanted to present the gospel. So Janet and I went to see Gina's mother, Pat. By the way, they called her Pretty Pat. She's beautiful, right, Jean? Beautiful. I did something I've never done before or after. And I, I've got several stories like this, things that I felt led to do that I'd never done before and never before. I presented the gospel, and I sensed an overwhelming sense. Mike, you've done it, given an invitation, and the Holy Ghost wouldn't let you close. You just you, you felt it was not yours to close. He was at work, and you needed to wait. I presented the gospel, and she rejected. But I, I didn't feel it was a genuine rejection. Janet sitting beside me, here's what I did. I really believe God wants to save you tonight, but the um, last thing I'll ever do is force you. I can't force you. And just for the record's sake, if I could, <laughs> I would. Because right after I forced you, you'd hug me, kiss me, and hallelujah, brother, all right? Uh, but I can't. So let me tell you what I did. I've never done this before in my life. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I said, uh, Pat, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to extend my hand. And before I finish praying, if you change your mind and you want to get saved before we leave, take my hand. And I began to pray, and while I was praying, she put her hand in mine and a letter to Christ. And I say, why, why do you think that's so significant? Because a few days later, she was going up her stairs, and I don't know if the family knows, but she lost her balance somehow. I don't know whether she fainted or just lost her balance, but she fell, and the doctor told me that there was no break in her fall, and the back of her head hit the steps, and she never gained consciousness, consciousness again, and I did her funeral. I have a plaque. It is a, it's an old plaque now. It's over 35 years. But I've got a plaque that she gave me about when Jesus carried me, when I only saw two sets of footprints in the sand, that's where I got that from. Forgiveness. Her debt was discharged. Her guilt was gone. Her conscience was cleared. The past was pardoned and the record was removed. So I might as well tell it all. The song tonight was sung for that family. The song about midnight cry because she's looking forward to seeing her mama again. And I, you know, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor 43 years. Somebody asked me, they say, what's it going to be like to not be a pastor? And I said, I've got a question. Is pastoring a position or a calling? I'll be a pastor till I draw my last breath. But I've often said to families, if you're not saved, this person was, get a good look before we cl close the casket because you'll never see them again. Right after I got saved, there was a man that had been witnessing to me from Wilmington, North Carolina. And he was about 50. I was 20. So here he was, 30-some years older than me, but we became best friends. So he asked me, he said, when I die, I've put it in the will. I would like for you to do my funeral. If you can get back, if you're traveling, do my funeral. And I said, I promise you I'll do it. So sure enough, at 95, the family called me. But he called me before he died, and he said, I have a special request. Never have had this request. His name's Hal Langley. I said, what's that, Hal? He said, I want you to leave the casket open until you finish your sermon. So he, he told me, but he didn't tell anybody else. But the family read the will, and they called me and said, Pastor, Daddy's made an unusual request that you may be uncomfortable with. And I said, no, I know what it is. And they said, 
Did he tell you why he wants the casket open? I said, he did. He said he wanted to hear me one more time. <laughs> he did. So God is my witness. Sunset Park Baptist Church. When I finished preaching, I leaned over where I could see him in the casket. I said, what do you think? And it scared the fire out of the people. <laughs> They thought he was going to raise up and say, good job, Pastor. <laughs> Number four, doubt is on the prowl. When Jesus is in the house, doubt is on the prowl. Son, thy sins have forgiven thee. Why does he speak blasphemies? No one can forgive sin but God only. Or stay with me, intellectually. I'm going to show you what that means. And then theologically, it's a biblical doctrine. The Jews intricately connected sin and suffering. They argued that if a man was suffering, he must have sinned. Look at your Bible carefully. Job chapter 4, verse 7. Eliphaz. Remember now, who ever perished being innocent? Where were the upright ever cut off? The rabbis had a saying, and I quote, There is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven him. So what they were saying is, oh yeah, you can say, your sins have forgiven you. But I'm telling you, the man is laying on that pallet as a paralytic because of his sin. And by the way, who can forgive sin but God only? Therefore, if the man can get up and walk, intellectually to the Jew, it would mean that his sin had been forgiven. Therefore, Jesus would be God, right? And when he said, which is easier? Well, I think it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. But if you say, take up your pallet and walk. So when Jesus asked that, then he looked over at him and said, take up your pallet and walk. I just think it happened like this. They'd never moved. Get up, he told him. He, he rolls up his pallet, puts it up under his arm. And I'll just be honest, I, I'm Native American. I'm about as dark and I'm a, about 38% African American. I'm a half-breed. Spaniards married Cherokees but the Spaniards in the 1500s had had relationship with their slaves in Africa. And all this has been verified in my life. They say that it, a white man can't preach till he gets mad. A black man can't preach till he gets happy. And us Indians, we can just preach all the time. <laughs> and so what I think happened is when he stood up, I don't think he just said, thank you. I think he... I believe when he walked home, he knocked at the door and mom probably said, see who that is. And Dad might have said, I thought it was my boy, but it couldn't be him. I can, I can see him at the door and the boy's walking. That's what happens when Jesus is in the house. There was a transplant. And by the way, the word that is used there speaks really of an inward transformation. It carries the tune of metamorphosis. Uh, Jesus changed this man. This man was saved. Deity, number five, was proven. Two things. I'm through in three minutes, maybe. <laughs> God, the fact that he is deity. And by the way, uh, Mike and I are moving on up in age. But I, I see some young men writing. I bet there's some college students, seminary students, young preachers. I want to say something to you. 
the greatest doctrine that will come under attack in the next generation is the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is God. He's God alone. It's not just a song. He has no rivals. He's the only true God. And he's the only one that can forgive sin. And the only one that can open heaven for you. Who can forgive sins but God only? One scholar put it this way. Jesus is either Lord or lunatic. He's either God or imposter. He's either God or blasphemer. Then Jesus said this, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I um, have been blessed that God's let me preach uh, with so many of my heroes. Um, this is interesting. I've never, I've not even told my wife this, but Bill Stafford's family called me and he's getting near the end. And they've asked me to do his funeral. I did Freddie Gage's funeral. What a, what a great joy. I was part of Adrian Rogers' retirement celebration. I was a preacher for Manly Beasley's funeral. I mean, what these people were my, my heroes. And I love to quote them. I've been quoting um, Warren Wiersbe more than usual because he just went to be with the Lord. But listen to this, and, and I'll give a couple statements and story and quit. If our sins are to be forgiven... And let this settle in on who's your one, your mother, your father, your children, your sibling. And by the way, I, I hate to say this, but somebody's got to say it. When a lady says to me, hey, pray my son get back in church. He's a Christian, but he just doesn't come to church anymore. And I said, well, tell me about your son. Well, he got saved at vacation Bible school when he's six, but he hadn't been in church in 21 years. Let me tell you what's wrong with the church. I wrote 12 messages on this. You have not learned to distinguish the difference between a decision and a disciple. Let me tell you the difference. A disciple has the seed of God in them, which is reproductive, and you reproduce. His disposition is in you. His nature, you can't keep it in you. I mean, it's just going to come out. But a decision is just a decision. And, and, and there's some of you holding on that you've got a son that got saved and hadn't been to church since Moby Dick was a tadpole, I'm telling you, and, and as a result, you've quit witnessing to him. You, you've started just praying, saying he's just backslidden. If our sins are to be forgiven, it must be while we're still on earth. Both character and destiny are fixed at death. The Bible offers no hope of redemption beyond the grave. And, and so I want to quote John Phillips and just give you the last statement. The rich man in Lazarus, Jesus made this statement. It said, the, the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. He instantly, the moment he died, a lost person, the moment they die, they go to hell. The Bible says that the poor beggar died and the angels came and carried him to a place of honor, Abraham's bosom, and immediately, immediately. And then Jesus said this, there's a great gulf fixed. So here's John Phillips' quote. There's a path that runs from earth to heaven. I've got it in my phone now. Roger West died. Roger's a good friend of mine, real good friend. He called me the other day and he said, Johnny, you're not going to believe this. And if you get a chance to drop by and see me, I got, had numbness in my leg, tingling, wouldn't go away. And I just went to the doctor that I'm healthy and working on the largest real estate deal of my life. I have a stage four inoperative brain cancer. And he died in three and a half weeks. His funeral will be this coming Saturday. But let me tell you the good news. There's a path that leads from earth to heaven. I really believe with all my heart right now while I'm preaching to you, and we haven't done this memorial service yet, Roger is in heaven. The Bible says there's a path that runs from earth to hell. You, you could die after this service, and if you're not saved, you could be in hell before I get to the airport. But there is no path that runs from hell to heaven 
The Mormons believe there is, and the Catholics believe there is. They call it purgatory. Purgatory is a myth. The endless masses said for dead men's souls are full of vain hope. I was just in India preaching. They believe in reincarnation. When there was a traffic jam, it's because the cows were in the street and the cows are their ancestors. And if they live a good life, they'll go in karma to another good life. And then if they can live another life, and before too long they can get to the better and the best, sort of like Joel Osteen, best life now. <laughs> and just for the record's sake, it's not the best life now. It's the best life there. And last of all, God was praised. Immediately, the Bible says in verse 12, they were amazed. I like to say, if you're from South Georgia, that means you were flabbergasted. They glorified God and said, we never saw it on this fashion. I, I wrote two closing statements. Here they are. Healing would allow this man to walk home. Forgiveness would allow him to walk into heaven. <clears throat> the leading female cancer doctor in the state of Georgia died at 45. She went in for a mammogram, and they missed the spot. And she's the leading female cancer surgeon in Atlanta. Her husband, Ted Fabian, is a plastic surgeon. His business is in Buckhead. He has two other partners that work for him. It's his, his company. When they diagnosed her with the cancer, all of the surgeon friends came around and said, we're going to guarantee you 15 more years. Further diagnosis, 10 years. Five years. We buried her in six months. Ted couldn't go back to work. He had lost the love of his life. But he was agnostic, best, borderline atheist. So he didn't want to hear anything about God. But a lady worked for him, and all he could tell me, and here's what he did. He came to my office, and he brought his phone. He said, Mr. Hunt, we've never met. He's about 50 years old. He said, would you allow me to read what I've written that I need to say to you without you interrupting me. I said, go ahead. We never met. Sharp guy. And so Ted began to tell the story. He said, this lady, there was something about her, a presence about her. She was different than anybody else in my office. And one day she came to me and handed me a card and said, would you do me a favor? And here's how he responded. I didn't know what she was going to ask, but because she had been such an encourager, the answer was going to be yes. Whatever you ask me, I'll do. She said, he said, would you watch this Sunday? And it was a card about my webcast Sunday morning. And she said, watch it at 11 o'clock. He has a home in Hilton Head, so he was there. So he said, I sat down on the couch and thought, here I am. I'm going to watch a Baptist preacher just for her. He said his dog was sitting beside him. So he sat on the couch, just the two of them. And he said, Mr. Turner, I want you to know I, I was on the broadcast 15 minutes before you came on. He said, by the way, the first song, that girl was not very good. <laughs> just for the truth. He said, but I'll tell you, I really liked that second girl. She was good. And I said, well, thank you, doctor. He said, it got up, and when you stood up, it, Crawler said, Pastor Johnny Hunt. And I said in my mind, I'm closing with this story. I said in my mind, watch him. He'll beg for money. And guess what? I'll guarantee it. I will guarantee it. Every time, I'll guarantee it. I will. We're one of the greatest giving churches per capita in the nation. Begging pays off. And so, um, so I did. I made my appeal for money. And then he said, they sang another song. And he said, then you got up. And this time, you stood with your Bible and he said, I can't believe this. I'd been embarrassed for my friends to know this. But you asked your congregation to stand for the reading of the word. And I stood. He said, when I stood, I still remember the dog got up like we were going somewhere. 
I mean, he was detailed. And then he said this. He said, Mr. Hunt, the longer you preached, the less I could hear your voice, but I was becoming ever more aware of another presence. That was his words. Plastic surgeon. And he said, and then you said this. You said, whether you're in this room or you're watching me and I'm, I'm, that I'm, I'm able to be heard in 60% of the world's population every Sunday through satellite TV with Michael Youssef. I'm the gospel preacher from Michael Youssef's ministry around the world. I'm his number one preacher in Egypt. They think I'm an Egyptian. I said, I don't know where you are, but this morning, God may be calling your name. And he said, I really felt Jesus calling my name. And that morning, I said, I'm going to pray with you. And if you would like to repent and place your faith in Christ, make this prayer your prayer and pray with me. And he said, I've stood up, and I've never had anybody in my life to tell me this. He said, he placed his hand on the screen, and he prayed. And he said, I've been a different man ever since. And so I'm sitting there and said, will you baptize me? Here's what you need to know about me baptizing him. I told briefly his story. Christy, after the baptism, and he dried off and came back, women lined up down the whole aisle and said, your wife removed my breast cancer. I'm alive today because your wife did my cancer. Dr. Uh, Fabian just stood there and wept. And then he said, can I see you in your office after the service? Now, listen to this story. He said, remember I told you, Mr. Hunt, I criticized you for asking for money? He said, yeah. He said, did you know now when I watch you online, I listen to what you need money for. And it sounds like you and your wife are heavily involved in Cuba. And I love that y'all are trying to make a difference in sex trafficking. And I love all the ministries y'all do. So this is my first gift since I became a Christian. And he gave me $100,000. <laughs> uh, by the way, what does that say about who criticizes the offering? He was lost. He criticized it. When he got saved, he gave a hundred grand. He came to see me last Thursday. He's enrolled at Liberty University. He just did his first mission trip, and he said, I believe God's calling me. Ted Fabian, look it up, go, go online, look up, leading surgeon. God wants to save people. And that's what happens when Jesus is in the house. Father, in the name of Jesus, what a service. You have moved me to every emotion with music. We've had happy moments. We've had reflective moments. We've had glorious moments. And I really believe you're here. And I ask, if there's someone here that's never been saved, God changed their life tonight for the glory of God. And I pray that you would deeply burden every person here, that everyone would begin to reflect on who's my one. Is it a relative, a friend, a neighbor, a work associate, a classmate? God have mercy that we would face Christ one day empty-handed. God help us in Jesus' name to win others. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.